Uh, my name is Pat Williams. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace. Thanks so much for joining us as we close out our Straft series. I've loved this series a whole lot, and one of my favorite parts has actually been the theme verse that Tim has been sharing with us each week. And so I wanted to read it to you from a different translation this week. It says, Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. I've loved this verse. And so I wanted to start out with this. I'm going to show a statement. I want us to say this statement together. It's the next one, I think. This one. So let's say this together. I believe it's more blessed to give than to receive. I truly believe this. And this is a statement that I truly believe. I truly believe it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so as Jesus followers, I know that that's something that lives deep inside of us. And that's something that so many of you practice all the time. Your generosity is inspiring. It truly is inspiring. And it's making a difference, not just here in our church, not just in Demont, but around the world. Thank you so much for your generosity. And thank you for taking part in our strapped challenge. We've been extending this challenge to you each week. There's a little card in the seat back in front of you. If you haven't engaged with it, this is a great chance to do that today. We're challenging you to do one, two, three, as many as you want, different things as a part of this. The first is to do Christmas debt-free. I know for so many of us, uh, we plan on not taking too much debt in the Christmas season, but sometimes things just get out of hand, and so maybe we we start to rack up those credit card bills. And so we're encouraging you to do Christmas debt-free. The second thing on the connection or on that card is to enroll in I Was Broke, Now I'm Not. This is a six-week class that I'm going to be leading in the new year where we're going to look at biblical biblical principles, biblical foundations on how we can get out of debt ourselves. And the third one is to set up online automated giving. And this is the best way to stay current and consistent in your giving. And a lot of you already do that. And so we just want to say thank you. For those of you that have taken part in the Strap Challenge already, you've already turned in that card. Thank you for doing that. We've had over 150 people engage in this challenge saying that they want to move forward. They want to challenge themselves in this way. So we're so thankful for that. I'm excited to be able to speak today on generosity because I truly believe that this is something that's so important. It's so important for us to talk about, to grow in, to strive to do better at. And so let's start with a word of prayer. God, I just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity to worship you here at Grace. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us this morning. Speak to our hearts. Help to challenge us, to strengthen us, to grow us in our generosity. Lord, I pray that you would lay next steps onto our hearts this morning and that we would be bold enough to take them. In your name we pray, amen. So I wanted to start with this simple thought. Most Americans don't feel rich, and yet we are. And most Americans feel generous, and yet we're not. So I'll say that again. Most Americans don't feel rich, and yet we are. And most Americans feel generous, and yet we're not. So let's, let's unpack this. Most of us don't feel rich, and the reason we don't feel rich is because there's always someone richer, right? There's always someone that has more, that has better, that has bigger. And when we compare ourselves to those people, we don't feel rich. But if we compare ourselves with the people around this world, we would begin to see how incredibly blessed we are. Depending on what study you look at, uh, they would say that anyone that owns their own vehicle is in the top 6 to 9% of wealthiest people in the world. We are so blessed. Think about some of the things that we take for granted on a regular basis. I'm sure maybe you had this type of experience this past week. You got into your car to drive to your favorite restaurant. And maybe you pass two or three other restaurants just to go to your favorite one. And then you get in there and you get a little ticked because maybe there's five, ten minute wait for your table. But you finally do get seated and somebody comes up, they take your order, they go into the back, they put their order on the rack and somebody else cooks your food for you. They made it just for you. They bring it back out. You get to eat it. Then someone else comes and they clean up your food after you. We're blessed. We get in our cars and we drive home. We press a button, if you're like me at least, you get to press that button and the door opens for you and you feel like a king for a moment. And then you pull your car into a house designed just for your car. Some of us, we have a two or a three car house just for our cars. That's how blessed we are. Then we get inside and it's climate controlled, meaning if we want it 72 year round, it's 72 year round and we love it. And we're in our homes and, well, at some point we have to go to the bathroom, right? So we go into the bathroom and then, well, 
we, we, we all know this, right? Everybody poops. This, this is kind of common knowledge. So we, we go to the bathroom, and we're in the bathroom, and then we, we go to the bathroom, and then you press a button, and your stuff goes away. If you don't thank God every now and then that your stuff goes away, you're missing out on a true blessing. Because there are people in the world, when they go to the bathroom, uh, their stuff don't go nowhere. It just stays right there in the hole. But our stuff, our stuff goes away. We're blessed. We're so blessed. Most of us, we are really blessed. And we don't even know it. But the problem is, is that we think that we're generous as Americans, and a lot of times we're not. I wanted to share this statistic. It says that the average American actually gives away only 2.6% of their income. And that's coming from the National Center for Charitable Statistics. And the truth is, is that's not God-honoring, is it? It's not generous. But as Jesus followers, we do something different. We lead the way in irrational generosity because we truly believe it's more blessed to give than to receive. And the reason why people don't give more is because they don't feel like they can give more. Uh, I don't know anybody here today that wouldn't say, I don't want, or I want to give more. I don't want to give more. I don't know anybody that would say, I never want to give any more. No, we all want to give more, but we feel like we can't give more. And, and, and we'll say things that show that off, that show that we feel like we can't give more. I grew up going to Catholic Mass on Christmas and Easter. My, love, my wife loves this fact. She loves that I've got a Catholic background. It's a great conversation starter. Uh, and so she'll tell people, well, my, my husband used to be Catholic. And so we would go to, we would go like Christmas and Easter. And uh, well, we would go and I'd sit there with my mom and I'd watch the offering basket pass us by. And I'd often ask mom, why, why don't we put anything in the offering basket? And she would say statements like this to me and perhaps you've said them before too. Well, there's just not enough. I wish I could give more, but I can't afford to. We never can get ahead. We're always behind. And what this is, is it's a consumption mindset. And the problem with a consumption mindset is that a consumption mindset can quickly become a consumption cycle in our lives. Let me explain. Uh, with everything, we believe as Jesus followers that God blesses us, that God gives to us. All that we have, we, we talked about this summer, all good and perfect things we have, it comes from God. Our paychecks, our finances, it all comes from God. So God blesses us. But when you're in a consumption mindset, the first thing you do when God blesses you is you consume. We spend it. We, we go out, we consume, we spend all that we've got, and then we get to the end of the month, and we're like, there's, there's not enough left. I, I don't know how I'm going to pay these bills. We, we don't have anything left over. We, we're, we're short. And then we start to lack, and we realize we're lacking because we're short. We can't make this bill. And then we get afraid, right? That's that natural emotion. After you realize you don't have enough left in the bank account, you're afraid. And so what do you do? Well, then you start to take out more debt to cover that because you're short. So you consume more. And then you realize you're short even more. And then you're more afraid and you're stuck in this cycle of consumption. Most of us, we would call this paycheck to paycheck living. God gives to us. We consume it all. We're lacking. We're short. And then we get afraid. And then we consume more. And then we're lacking again. And then we're short. And then we're afraid. And we just keep going in this cycle. And you'll hear it in our language because we'll say things like, I wish we could do more, but we can't. I never can seem to get ahead. No matter what I do, there's just never, ever enough. But as Jesus followers, we have a totally different mindset. We don't have a consumption mindset. Because of what God's done for us through Jesus, we do something different first. And when we do something different, God does something. And it creates a different cycle. It's not a cycle of consumption. It's a cycle of abundance. So let me, let me explain it. We start with this same thing. God blesses us. God gives to us. He pours out his blessings upon us. He helps us have that paycheck, whatever it is that we need. And as Jesus followers, what's the first thing we do? It's not consume. It's give generously. We give generously. And why do we do that? Because of what God's done for us. We love to give generously. Paul, in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, he says this, You must decide in your heart how much to give. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. I love that. If you ever feel pressured to give, don't do it. It's biblical. Don't do it. If you're at Tyson's and the Salvation Army's ringing the bells and you feel pressured to give, don't do it. It's biblical. You come to church, you feel pressured to give, don't give. It's biblical. You can say that to me all day long and I'm going to buy it because it's right there. It's in 2 Corinthians 9. Paul says it. And here's why he says it though. He says it because God loves a person who gives cheerfully. 
God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And this is what we do as Jesus followers. We give cheerfully. We give joyfully. We believe it's a massive blessing to be a blessing to others through what we give. Then what happens? Okay, we give generously. And what does God do? God multiplies abundantly. God multiplies abundantly. If we continue down with that verse, it says, And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. It's a beautiful section of Scripture. I absolutely love this. God blesses us. We give generously, and then God multiplies abundantly. And and I want to make it it clear right here, this doesn't mean that God's going to multiply abundantly the money in your bank account. No, it means that God's going to multiply what you give to have a greater impact than you could have ever imagined. Because we think, well, if I just give this little bit, it's only going to be used for this little bit. But no, God just does amazing things through it. He blesses, he impacts the nations through the gifts that we give. He multiplies abundantly. And then what happens next is so cool. When we see God using the gifts, the resources that we've given, when we see the impact that it has, we start to grow in our faith. We grow because we see what God's doing. We see him working in amazing ways, and we think, wow, that's amazing. And the natural instinct then, whenever I see that at least, the natural instinct is I want to give more. I want to see what else God's going to do. I want to keep growing in my faith. What we've done, though, is we've created a completely different cycle. It's not a, it's not a cycle of consumption. It's a cycle of abundance. God blesses us. We give generously. God multiplies abundantly. We grow in our faith, and it just keeps going around and around. We're going to look at one of the greatest miracles in the Gospels today, uh, and it's from Mark chapter 6, and it's the story of where Jesus feeds the 5,000. And I I want to put a little context around this, because Jesus didn't actually feed 5,000. So the Bible's lying, right? Well, no, the Bible's not lying. What happens is that in the Jewish culture, whenever they would do a count, they would only count adult males. And so they counted 5,000 adult males. They didn't count the women and the children that were present. So more than likely, what was there is actually 15 to 20,000 people. To put that into context, that's the size of the average NBA stadium. Okay, so Jesus is about to feed an NBA stadium's worth of people. It's just crazy. And we're going to jump in right at verse 34. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was very late in the day. So the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already very late. This is the modern day way of saying, wow, would you, would you look at the time? He continues on, Jesus, they said to Jesus, Jesus, send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. And I could just picture this, right? Peter walks up to Jesus. Jesus, oh, that sermon, it's so good. That 18th point, I'm really going to post that one on Instagram later on, right? Uh, But listen, well, the sun, well, you know the sun, right? You made the sun. Well, the sun's going down. I'm good. I mean, I am totally good. I could listen to you preach all day, but Philip and Andrew, they're, they're getting hungry. In fact, they're bordering on hangry right now. Maybe we should just dismiss the people, let them go back to town, let them get some food, because we don't got anything out here in the countryside. And then I want you to, I want you to notice what happens in this story. Okay, because the disciples, they become focused on one word. Verse 36, send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus answers them, you give. You see, the disciples, they're preoccupied with what they're going to have to spend. But Jesus doesn't say a word about what they're going to have to buy or spend. He just says, you give them something to eat. So they say back to him, that's going to take more than a half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? And Jesus asks them a question. I pray that that's a question you'll ask yourself at some point. He says, what do you have? What do you have? How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And so they did, and what they found was that they had a little boy with five loaves of bread and two fish. And just imagine, this, this story's happening. They're right in the middle of this story. And what we see is two groups of people viewing this from two very different perspectives, from two very different mindsets. The disciples, they see this all through the mindset of consumption. God blesses us. We've got five loaves. We've got two fish. God's blessed us but that's not enough. We're lacking. We're short. We're not going to be able to make it. I'm afraid. How are we going to feed 15 to 20,000 angry people? We're going to use it all up. This amount that we have, it's laughably small 
in light of how much we need. Have you ever found yourself feeling like that? Like maybe you're finally getting ahead in your finances. You're finally making some, some way in that debt. And then that medical bill comes in. Or then something expensive breaks and you think to yourself, oh, it's ridiculous what I have in light of how much I actually need right now. And I don't want to diminish those situations that we find ourselves in, those crises, because we're all going to have that crisis pop up at some times in our life. But if we allow that crisis, if we allow that thinking that there's not enough, that we don't have enough, that can quickly become our mindset for the rest of our life, where we constantly think, I don't ever have enough. And that's just not true. See, Jesus, when he sees this story play out, he sees it from a completely different lens. He sees it through the lens of abundance, and that just simply means that there is always more than enough. You fast forward to the end of the story, the end of this miracle. Uh, every, it says that everybody ate and was satisfied. Jesus sends out the disciples to clean up after the fifteen to 20,000 people, and what they end up having is 12 basketfuls of broken bread. So just, just track with me. Five loaves, two fish, The disciples see that, and they say, it's not enough. And Jesus says, yeah, it is. No, Jesus, it's it's laughably small in light of what we need. And Jesus is just simply saying, guys, really, it's plenty. You see, friends, abundance is a cycle. It's a cycle. When God gives to us, we as Jesus followers, we return the first 10% back to him, and we call this the tithe. It's an act of worship. It's because of God's goodness. It's because of all that he's given us that we give back to him. We believe as Jesus followers that when we give back to God, that God opens the windows of heaven and he pours his blessings out on us so that we can be a blessing to others. And then he multiplies what we've given and he does amazing things with it. And then our faith, it starts to grow because of all the amazing things that we're seeing happening. And then we give more and we've created this new cycle of abundance because our God is so good. And our God is so very powerful. Everybody gives, but not everybody is generous. So how do we, how do we as Jesus followers grow in our generosity? How do we grow to become abundant givers, reflecting the heart of an abundantly good God who has blessed us so that we can be a blessing to people all over the world? I want to give us three different ways that we can do that. And the first is this. We give spontaneously. We give spontaneously. There's going to come a time in your life where you're going to see a need in someone else's life, and you're going to think, wait, I, I could meet that need. I, I could help there. I have the gifts. I have the ability. I have the time. I have the skills. I could be a blessing to that person. And you're going to give spontaneously to help in that way. And that's, that's honestly how, how many people around the world give. It's how many of you have given at some point in the past. There's an earthquake at some other part of the world, and so we give generously. We give spontaneously to help meet that need. Or maybe there's somebody at work who, who's going to be short on rent, and so you organize an office pool to cover the rent expenses for that month. We give spontaneously, and it's a great way to give. It's an important way to give. This is how the Good Samaritan in the story that Jesus shares gives. If you're unfamiliar with the story, there's a Jewish man who's walking down the street. He gets robbed, beaten up, and left for dead on the side of the road. Some Jewish religious leaders, they come walking by, and they see the man, and they just keep walking. But a Samaritan man who, by cultural standards, would not talk to a Jewish person, he sees the Jewish person. He comes up, and he says, there's a need. I can meet that need. He bandages the person up. He puts them on his donkey. He takes them to the hotel. He pays for the hotel. He pays for the medical expenses. He tells the hotel owner, listen, if there's more expenses, when I come back through, I will pay off any remaining debt. He gives spontaneously. And here's the thing. That Samaritan, he didn't wake up saying, I'm going to be awesome today and do something super awesome for someone else. No, he, he woke up and he saw a need and he said, I, I, I can meet that need. I can do that. And a lot of us, We see those needs and we think, I can do that. And so we do. We give spontaneously. But please don't only give spontaneously. This is where most people stop. If you only give spontaneously, you're going to be limited in the impact that you can have through your giving. We start there 
but we don't stop there. As Jesus followers, we not only give spontaneously, but we give strategically. We give strategically. We give prayerfully and strategically. Uh, We give out of a prayerful heart. You hear that story and you think, I wish there's more that I could do for someone in need. And there is. But you have to plan to do that. You have to plan to give more. We have to be strategic as givers. As Jesus followers, the first 10%, we give that back to God. And we give it to God as a prayerful act of worship. We don't give it because we have to. We give it because we want to. We want to give back to God through the church. And so we give that 10% back. We don't give last. We give first. The Bible talks about first fruits giving. That's what we do as Jesus followers. We plan to put God first in every area of our lives, including our finances. And that's hard, but we do it because that's what God tells us to do. It's an act of worship. It's a strategic, prayerful response to all that God does. I love this verse from Isaiah 32.8. It says, generous people plan to do what is generous. That's good. And they stand firm in their generosity. They plan it. Most of us, what do we plan to do with our money? We plan to spend it. We plan to consume We see something at the store and we say, I gotta have that. New shoes, gotta have it. New tractor, gotta have it. It's DeMott, so I can drop the tractor reference. New tractor, gotta have it. I gotta have it, I gotta have it. We we plan to consume. But as Jesus followers, we're not spiritual consumers. No, we're spiritual contributors. Okay, we don't believe that the church exists for us. We believe that we are the church and we exist for the world. We exist to be a blessing to the world through our generosity. Instead of planning to spend our money, what if we planned to make a difference in the world through our giving? Generous people plan to do what is generous. That's what we do as Jesus followers. We plan to do what is generous. We stand firm in our generosity. We don't just give spontaneously, but we, with prayer and a heart of worship, we give strategically. The third area, if you're taking notes, is this. We give sacrificially. There's so many powerful examples of sacrificial giving in the scriptures, but there's none more powerful than the story of Jesus in chapter 12 of Mark. He's in the offering, uh, he's in the temple courts where they take the offering, and he and his disciples, they sit down across from the offering plate, and he watches people come in and put their offering into the basket. And he does that because he can tell where a person's heart is by how and what they give. And so he's watching, and he's watching rich person after rich person come in and put their offering in. And then he sees a poor widow come in, and she puts in two coins. And he pulls his disciples together, and he says this, Truly, this poor widow, this woman who would have been living off the scraps of other people, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all of the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. And what's really interesting to me about this story is two things. One, that he sat and watched. That's interesting. That that one perplexes me. He's watching and he wants to see where people's heart is at. But the second thing that really interests me is that he didn't stop the poor widow. Because if I'm the pastor on call, I'm going to be honest. If a poor widow came in to put all that she had into our offering basket, I'd be one of the first to say, whoa, wait, stop. It's okay. You need this. You need this. Take it. We've got this covered. You you need this. But Jesus doesn't stop her. Jesus doesn't rob her of the blessing of giving. And instead, he celebrates her sacrificial gift. She's given more than anybody else, it said. That's what we do as Jesus followers. We give spontaneously. We give strategically. And we give sacrificially. I know for many of you, you've engaged with our strap challenge already. You've checked off one of those boxes. Thank you for that. It's awesome. We're praying for you. We're excited for you. And I definitely want to encourage you, if you haven't done that yet, consider that. But for many of us, maybe we're already done all three of those. Or maybe you've checked off one and you just need to to be pushed a little bit more. And so in an ever-loving spirit of Pat, I love to give people a little nudge. I love to kind of just, just give us a little push. I love to push myself. I will never push or never encourage or never challenge anyone to do something that I'm not willing to do. So this challenge goes out to me just as much as it does to the rest of you. So I want to extend a challenge a little bit beyond that strapped one. Start with that strapped one if you haven't. But if you have, consider one of these things. Consider giving one of those three ways. 
to close out this year. If you've been kind of prompted by God, he's been laying it on your heart just to give spontaneously. Pray about that and consider doing it. What would it look like for you just to give spontaneously in the month of December? Or maybe God's been prompting you to finally sit down and to look at your finances and to say, how can I strategically plan to give just a little bit more? Again, I, I don't ever feel pressure. There's no pressure. That's biblical. Don't give if you feel pressured. But I just I want to push that challenge just a little bit. Maybe that's something that you need to consider doing. Okay, maybe, maybe you're at 10% already. What would it strategically look like for you to move it to 11? Maybe you're at 2. What would it look like it just to go up to 3? Pray about that. Strategically, how could you do that? Or maybe God's challenging you just to give sacrificially. I mean, Mother Teresa has this great quote. She says, give, but give until it hurts. Maybe that's something that God's prompting you to do. I don't know. I just want to encourage you to consider that challenge, to go a little bit farther in your generosity as we close out this new year. In a few moments, we're going to get ready to, to receive our offering. And there are three different ways that you can do that today. You could give in the basket. You could give online. You could set up a uh, text to give. That's a great way to give a spontaneous gift. But, but here's what I want, to, I want to close by saying. You know, grace exists to connect people to God, his church, and his world. And one of the things we really hope that you've learned or understood or began to, to grasp over this series is that what we have, it's not ours. What we have is not ours. It's a blessing from God. And he calls us to be a blessing to others through that. Okay, he gives to us. And what is the first thing we do? We give generously. God multiplies that and he impacts the nations. Friends, I don't know if you know this, but God is impacting the nations through what we give. Truly in amazing ways. One of the missionaries that we support in India, I recently found out that they've started multiple churches through the generosity of our congregation. God is multiplying that impact beyond what we could ever imagine. And so prayerfully consider, how could you grow in your generosity? Not out of pressure, we never ever want to pressure you. But again, out of a cheerful, joyful heart, how could you increase, how could you grow in that area? Join me in a word of prayer as we get ready to receive the offering. Father, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for how you have provided for all of us here. Lord, you've given us so much, and we are so very thankful for it. This weekend, we've celebrated a day all about giving thanks for all that we have, and again, we, we do just want to say thank you. But today, I, I want to ask that you'd continue to work in our hearts. Help us to open ourselves up to truly becoming the generous people that you called us to be. Lord, we thank you for blessing us, and we ask that you would continue to bless us so that we might be a blessing to others. Continue to help us grow in our generosity each and every day. Amen.